As predictable as they may be, there's something quite comforting about television schedules. Knowing that the same shows are on at the same time each day can bring about a sense of order and security. Or maybe it's just me who thinks that. But what happens when something that isn't supposed to be on TV is shown on TV? And what's creepier? The intrusion? Or the fact that the culprits are very rarely identified? In this video, we'll be taking a look at some prolific broadcast intrusions. I know that some people don't find this kind of thing disturbing and actually find it quite funny, but I don't know. There's just something about these incidents that really puts me on edge. It'd be wrong not to talk about the Max Headroom incident in a video about broadcast intrusions, seeing as it's likely the most well-known incident of its kind. On the 22nd of November 1987, thousands of people who were watching the 9 o'clock news on Chicago's WGN Channel 9 witnessed something very unusual. During the news program's sportscast, static could be heard, and then the screen suddenly went black. This is what happened next. Now, I'm sure many of you will have already seen this footage, but I just want to warn anyone who's new to it that it is quite disturbing. I remember watching it for the first time when I was much younger, and to be honest, I still don't like it. Well, if you're wondering what's happened, <laughs> so am I. Actually, the computer that we have running our news from time to time took off and went wild. So what we're going to do is start over from the top of the Bears and tell you once again about the 30 to 10 victory they had over Detroit today out at Soldier Field. Can you imagine witnessing that as it happened? How do you think you'd react? The person in the footage is wearing a Max Headroom rubber mask. Max Headroom was a so-called computer-generated TV personality. Matt Frewer, who portrayed Max Headroom, wore a lot of prosthetic makeup and was placed in front of harsh lighting in order to create the illusion of being a fake human. Now, I don't like masks at the best of times, but if a stranger in a mask based on a TV character who's already quite creepy popped up during the news, I'd probably throw my remote control at the screen. But this wouldn't be the only time the intruder made an appearance. Later that night, WTTW, another Chicago station, was showing an episode of Doctor Who. Once again, the signal was interrupted, and the Max Headroom impersonator appeared. In the last clip, there was audio, but no words were heard. This time, things were different. I'll get you a hot drink, man. intrusion lasted much longer than the first. I still haven't decided which I find the most unsettling, and I often wonder if the reason these clips disturb me is because I wasn't around when Max Headroom was around. Perhaps the viewers at home, who likely would have recognised the mask as being representative of Max, would have been less afraid for that reason. The discomfort some of us experience upon watching footage of the hijack could stem from the fact that we aren't entirely familiar with Max Headroom, or rather, we weren't familiar with him back in the 80s. Of course, I can only speak on behalf of people my age who are also afraid of the footage. Let's go back in time a little, to 9.16pm, just after the first intrusion had taken place over at WGN. Technicians suspected that the whole thing had been an inside job, and so they searched the building for someone donning the Max Headroom mask. They didn't find anyone. Understandably, quite a lot of viewers wanted to know what was going on, and both TV stations received many calls. 
The incident was covered by local newspapers, which all showed a perplexity towards what had happened. As funny as the mysterious intruder and some viewers might have found this incident, it absolutely wasn't a laughing matter. Hijacking a broadcast signal is a serious crime and the culprit would have faced a huge fine and jail time if they were caught. The reason things were taken so seriously is because there was no way of knowing if the hijacking method used by the offender could be utilised by more dangerous individuals such as domestic terrorists. This is why the FBI had to join the investigation. 33 years later, the case is as good as cold. The individual, or individuals, behind this prolific incident are likely still going about their daily business as if nothing ever happened. On the 26th of November 1977, just after 5pm, a six minute message from someone who referred to themselves as Vrillan was broadcast over the airwaves of a television station in southern England. Footage of the interruption can be found online, but for ease of listening, here is a brief transcription. This is the voice of Vrillan, the representative of the Ashtar Galactic Command speaking to you. For many years now you have seen us as lights in the skies. We speak to you now in peace and wisdom as we have done to your brothers and sisters all over your planet Earth. We come to warn you of the destiny of your race and your worlds so that you may communicate to your fellow beings the course you must take to avoid the disasters which threaten your world and the beings on our worlds around you. This is an order that you may share in the Great Awakening as the planet passes into the new age of Aquarius. The new age can be a time of great peace and evolution for your race, but only if your rulers are made aware of the evil forces that can overshadow their judgments. Be still now and listen, for your chance may not come again. All your weapons of evil must be removed. The time for conflict is now past, and the race of which you are a part may proceed to the higher stages of its evolution if you show yourselves worthy to do this. You have but a short time to learn to live together in peace and goodwill. While the message was by no means hostile, it left many people feeling anxious. Who was Frillin? Was he really an alien, or was he just a practical joker? Regardless of Frillin's true identity, I think we can all agree that the message he brought was an important one. John Repian, a Fortean author, has spoken at length about this hijacking incident. Here, he points out that, unlike so many of the broadcast interruptions which came after, mostly in the USA, there is nothing prankish about the Vrillin interruption. There's no punchline or rug pull, no swerving or obscenity, or explicit protest of the specific TV station or media in general. That keeps it ambiguous enough that there's still this glimmer of possibility, no matter how tiny, that the whole thing was, and is, somehow real. I forgot to mention that the videos here on YouTube which supposedly document the intrusion are all recreations. Footage of the actual event is nowhere to be found. Not all broadcast hijackers managed to get away with it. In the 1980s, cable TV began to experience unprecedented growth. People liked having a wider variety of channels to choose from. Unfortunately, as use of microwave transmissions was also increasing, pranksters were being given more opportunities to get their content onto the air. It was April 1986, and HBO was airing a film called The Falcon and the Snowman. A few minutes into the film, a set of coloured bars and some text appears on the screen. The screen stays like this for four minutes. This is John McDougall, also known as Captain Midnight. How did the authorities figure out he was the culprit? Well, he actually confessed. He was a video technician and satellite dish salesman. Around the time of the hijack, HBO and other providers had started scrambling satellite feeds. 
This meant people with satellite dishes would no longer be able to watch over-the-air content for free. Because of this, John McDougall's business had suffered. He believed HBO's rates for satellite dish owners were far too steep, so the intrusion was actually a method of protest. Interestingly, McDougall was surprised to see that his actions were being discussed on network television, and he actually felt guilty. When he returned to work, he acted like he knew nothing about the intrusion. The only people he made privy to the truth were close friends. Because he plea bargained, McDougall received a $5,000 fine and one year unsupervised probation. Broadcast intrusions are very uncommon, even more so today. But just because they're rare doesn't mean they can't happen. The next time you're watching TV at night, be wary of the screen turning black. There's no knowing who, or what, might make an appearance.